Underground Habitat Ring, Stickney Crater, Phobos. Saturday, December 9th, 3116, two hours later. The virtual tour had been very informative. As I suspected, the tunnels running through Phobos did indeed hold additional laboratory and research areas, along with a surprising amount of heavy automated industry and manufacturing capability. When we reached the huge conduits which carried energy from the fission power dynamos to the wormhole machinery, I understood the need for all the local heavy industrial manufacturing capacity. The power conduits ran in a long curving bore shaft which extended nearly 18 kilometers, connecting the atomic dynamo field on the asteroid's trailing end to the big wormhole installation centered on the far side of Phobos. Spaced within the tunnel were 16 heavy conductors, each over 160 millimeters in diameter, not including their thick insulating coatings. Though the huge power transmission grouping was capable of transferring well over 100 gigawatts of electrical energy, it was now simply a backup, as Phobos had recently been upgraded to use direct wormhole coupling to bypass most of the physical conductors. This not only provided redundancy, but increased efficiency by eliminating a sizable amount of resistive energy losses incurred by not using the resource-costly superconductors. The other benefit of the virtual tour besides saving time was that it enabled us to explore the more dangerous elements of the complex at close hand. Specifically, this meant we could safely observe the deadly, highly radioactive, and thermally intense environment of the atomic dynamo field. In addition to mitigating the physical dangers, Truffles had bypassed many of the realism filters for convenience, and it made for quite the unforgettable spectacle. I could barely keep from grinning constantly as the eight of us, Riho and Hannah now included, as they were able to join the virtual tour from where they had remained on Elon's second via telepresence, stood, unsuited but perfectly fine, in the full vacuum and highly radioactive environment of a dynamo's primary reaction chamber. The virtual tuning reducing the hellish thermal radiation emanating from the red-hot fuel injectors just a meter away to just a mild warm sensation, as if one were standing near a small fireplace. The tuning also allowed us to converse audibly despite the hard vacuum. Another benefit was that I felt normal Earth gravity, and as Ben and Deja didn't appear burdened, their personalized virtuality must have been subjecting them to the lighter Martian gravity. The bulk of the time savings allowed by the virtual tour was in the area of travel. Once we had seen one area and all questions for that area answered, Truffles would whisk us off to the next point of interest. I had to admit, Despite my general dislike of the high-tech simulation technology, this was far more efficient and I was able to see the logic and benefits of such a learning method. We finished the tour at the big wormhole installation on the moon's outer face. Even though I'd been involved with the early planning and had seen many images of the place since it had been constructed, seeing it up close with my own eyes, albeit virtually, was still an awe-inspiring eyepiece. First, the military wormhole complex was gigantic. I'd known that, of course, but had not really appreciated how big it was. Think football stadium big. The outer containment gantry was a 300-meter diameter hemispherical construction, half embedded into the surface of the far side of Phobos. The wormhole mechanism filled most of the interior volume. Our tour started at the gantry foundations, where 12 boreholes extended three kilometers deep into the moon to provide anchor points for the multiple carbon fiber tensioning tendons. The extensive underpinnings were needed in case of an accidental energy release, as it was feared anything substantial would rip the facility free from the moon's porous substrate. We stood, again naked in a hard vacuum, on a rim of the smooth-faced crater-like cavity excavated into the Phobos surface. Right next to us was one of the 12 massive support columns, which extended up and outward from the rim. All 12 supports curved inward before converging, forming the skeletal shape of the outer half of the hemisphere. Inside this spherical space was a massive circular ring. The ring was attached to the convergence point of the overhead skeleton and also at the base of the crater by two enormous rotating trunnions. Complex swiveling couplings surrounded the lower trunnion, providing rotating connections for energy, pressurized gases, and exotic matter. I remembered from the planning sessions that the couplings had enough freedom of movement 
to allow the ring to rotate well beyond 180 degrees in each direction. Inside the outer ring was a second inner ring, also attached at two trunnion points. These inner points were offset 90 degrees from the outer ring's trunnions and were located approximately in line with the moon's horizon. Again, there were complicated rotational connections for utilities joining the two rings. Inside the inner ring, and almost completely filling the 200-meter diameter interior void, was the actual wormhole torus itself. From where we stood, not much of this gigantic ring could be seen as it was covered with auxiliary equipment and devices. I'd seen something similar back on Vesta, although on a far smaller scale. I was pleased to learn from their questions and comments that the group's newcomers to the facility, Adele, Ben, and Deja, were able to deduce that what we were looking at was similar to a gyroscope. Truffles and Oxy confirmed their speculation and explained how the massive gimbaling mount was needed to compensate for the rapid eight-hour orbital period of Phobos, although the motion of Mars and our Sun added to the complexity. Despite my participation in the early planning sessions, I still learned many new details. One of these was that we'd modified the original design to include eight smaller wormhole mechanisms installed around the big inner coils of the main portal. These were local shunting wormholes and were used not only for bringing the antimatter munitions from the Lagrange Point Depot, but also for providing the energy and exotic matter streams needed to transition the big wormhole up to the enemy arc's fractional light speed velocity. There were also two redundant personal wormholes to quickly bring in space-worthy mobile units and human personnel needed for emergency repairs. The two fixed portals also fast-acting to serve as a rapid escape path while humans were present. With the massive pressures and quantities of energy, it was a highly dangerous area to occupy. We wrapped up the tour by watching the machinery in motion as it performed a simulated ultra-long-range wormhole projection. The massive gimbal moved faster than I'd expected as the rings compensated for the moonlet's motion. Experiencing it while riding along inside the central mechanism was nerve-wracking. Not only was there the motion, but Truffles had augmented the virtuality by adding crackling energy discharges along with a deep, bone-jarring vibration. Afterwards, when I had thanked Ux for her part in designing and building the facility, she admitted that some of the rumbling we'd experienced was just theatrics added for the virtual tour. The actual mechanism operated nearly vibration-free, as any rumbling would have affected the wormhole's targeting. I had to admit that it did enhance the experience, as did hearing Strauss's also Sprock Zarathustra playing in the background during the wormhole demonstration. Ben, Deja, and Adele had loved the tour, especially the thrilling conclusion. I'd enjoyed seeing their reactions as much as I had my own. The only downside to the tour was that it made me realize how complicated the Phobos facility was. There would be an enormous setback to the war effort if something happened to the big mechanism. After the virtual tour's conclusion, Ux directed us back to the control center, where she would be overseeing the deployment of the tungsten punji into the path of the enemy arc. Since the second attack was kinetic only with no antimatter warheads, the moon was deemed safe enough for me to be allowed to remain. Still, I had been offered the choice to be poked back to my apartment on Elon Tekken. Riho had messaged that she preferred me to join her, where it was marginally safer but would understand if I wanted to stay. After what I had seen today, I wanted to stay simply to pay tribute and acknowledge the hard work done by those stationed here. So now, here I was entwined in a gravity cradle positioned near Ux's control console, as if I was a visiting admiral about to lead a huge fleet into battle. Omu was nearby, a recharging cord extending from her abdomen and hardwired into a junction box, which also powered the cluster of consoles. Adele had stationed herself towards the rear of the big room. She was hanging from a high-mounted handhold, which provided a good vantage to image the ongoing countdown. Ben and Deja had abandoned us, already back on Mars after having taken advantage of the available wormhole queue slot I declined to utilize. Before they had left, the princess had surprisingly expressed her thanks to me personally for the tour. Maybe she was not as bad as I had first suspected. The countdown clock to wormhole activation dropped below one minute. I looked around the room, but the majority of other humans were occupied with their displays 
or often virtual monitoring areas under their responsibility. Three others, the safety and rescue personnel, were currently observers like me. Each of the three was wearing emergency vacuum gear with helmets left open. They were here just in case there was a pressure breach or some other accident and would assist if someone had trouble disconnecting from their cerebral connection. When I had been introduced to them earlier, I'd noticed with some amusement that all three had suit patches that read Zombie Herder. Still, as they were currently my only aware companions other than Adele and Omu, I caught their attention. Here's to good shooting today. Or luck, I said, raising my fist in solidarity. The three responded with nods and raised fists of their own. We all knew that the odds were slim that the first kinetic attack would score any hits. Despite recent improvements with its initial guidance, the big wormhole was simply not accurate enough to place the spikes where we needed with any surety. Still, I was happy with the improvements, where before the best we could hope for was that the big wormhole would form within a hundred kilometers of its target over an eight light year distance. We'd improved that by almost an order of magnitude. Now it could form the terminus at that distance in a 12 kilometer diameter sphere, or if measured perpendicular to the vector of the enemy, the wormhole would form anywhere in a circle of roughly 130 square kilometers, since our target was only 2.6 square kilometers in area. Our odds were slim, perhaps 1 in 50, but miracles happen all the time. We'd need one tonight. Tonight's first kinetic attempt would be a quick blind shot in the dark. Even though we would almost certainly miss, we still hope to gain valuable intelligence on the Ark's ability to detect oncoming objects and debris and deal with them. To gather this data, Sarissa would be creating a nearby surveillance wormhole to record the Ark's passage through our new minefield. Tonight's test was to also verify the delivery and deployment mechanism of the Punji bundle. A window showing the waiting bundle had just opened on the room's large view screen. Other windows opened as well on the control room's large view screen, and I quickly began scanning the new data. One window was displaying the three atomic dynamos needed for tonight's deployment as they throttled up to full power. Four seconds later, I felt a slight vibration in my gravity cradle. This small moonquake being caused by the distant operating magnetoplasma dynamic engines. I didn't notice any acceleration, but that was to be expected given the enormous mass of Phobos compared to our current usage of only a fraction of the total array. The big wormhole was also coming alive with activity. The bundle of tungsten rods had already been delivered and installed into a deployment mechanism which had been attached to the main portal torus. The other shunting wormholes were active and coupled to the big mechanism. Exotic matter was streaming into the compensation coils and being spun up to incredible velocities. I focused on the window showing a close view of the kinetic payload bundle. 37 hexagonal rods, each about 80 millimeters across and just over a meter and a half in length, with each massing in at 102 kilograms, made up the four-ton bundle. They were spaced evenly into a larger hexagonal package that was just under a meter across. Once they arrived in arc space, the package would separate under mechanical spring pressure and spread out at around 40 meters per second. Each rod was tipped with a star tracker on one end and a set of tiny reaction wheels on the other. Both would work together to orientate the narrow rods and ensure that each remained end-on facing the oncoming arc, thus minimizing their radar footprint. The countdown dropped below 10 seconds. The window showing the big wormhole shimmered from the gravimetric distortions caused by the tunnel being forced through space. Because of the large size of the aperture portal, the formation process took almost three times longer than it did with the smaller wormholes. The compensation coils stopped accelerating the exotic matter earlier than they had when we sent our missiles. This was because we were sending the tungsten bundle through without accelerating them to arc velocity. We were providing some spatial velocity, however, enough to counteract the motion of Mars and the Sun and deliver the bundle at dead rest to the local conditions near the arc's vector. Five, Ux said with her odd, deep immersion voice. Four, three, two, one, wormhole, open and stable. The big view screen now showed the huge spatial disruption ring. A sensor stalk was quickly inserted off to one edge, leaving plenty of room for the four-ton bundle of tungsten rods. 
The recording camera shook as a deploy magnet sent the heavy package through. A new window appeared which showed the view from the sensor stalk. Its camera was locked on the departing bundle, tracking it as it quickly moved away from the terminus. Two seconds later, the bundle burst apart and the window panned out slowly to capture the controlled, uniform expansion of the individual impactor rods. Deployment successful, the kinetic impactors are moving apart as planned and the spacing is uniform and within margins, Ux reported. We tested the bundle, of course, but watching it work when needed was still a relief. The rods quickly became difficult to follow, even with the thermal enhancement of the sensor's imager. I was able to follow one individual impactor for only a few seconds before it vanished into the black. It was amazing that such a diminutive object had the potential to wreak such havoc. I recalled the figures, thanks to the fractional light speed of the enemy arc colliding with just a single 100-kilogram rod would result in an energy release of about 6 megatons TNT equivalent. That would surely put a dent in the enemy's plans. The view screen showing the relayed image from the sensor cut off and I saw on another window that the big wormhole had closed. The abrupt shutdown had severed the sensor stalk. Um, we forgot to retract the sensor cluster, I commented dryly. It was disposable, Omu replied. The android caught my curious look and continued. It was left behind intentionally. We even increased its mass to just over 16 kilograms by filling the tubular stalk with lead granules. Hopefully, the enemy will run across it. Ah, of course. Run across it in the literal sense and collide with it. I felt embarrassed that I had not realized sooner. Um, do we know how accurate the wormhole placement was? I asked sheepishly, trying to cover my slow thinking. Data from the brief sensor deployment is still being analyzed by the Argus discrimination processors, Omu reported. They should return a location fix in five seconds or less. Our target had been a point in space located two light seconds ahead of the oncoming arc. Two light seconds equated to a distance of just under 600,000 kilometers. With the arc approaching at 7.496% of C or 22,472 kilometers per second, this meant that the enemy vessel would arrive at the area we just seeded with tungsten pungice in about 20 seconds. Of course, if our wormhole had been aimed perfectly and had still been active when the arc arrived and the two merged, well, the convergence backblast into Phobos would make for a very bad day at the gimbal complex. This danger was only one reason we'd close the wormhole so quickly, though. The other, more important primary reason was that we wanted to minimize revealing data to the enemy. The Ark obviously scanned interstellar space in its path looking for debris. We hoped our brief wormhole opening would limit the chances of the Ark scanners from noticing the six-meter spatial rift. The brief opening duration was also wise because the Ark likely had some form of shielding barrier traveling at some distance ahead of it. We had targeted our impactor deployment almost too close to the Ark because of the shield. We wanted to form our wormhole in the gap between any shield and the trailing Ark. This was that, even though the mass of the shield was likely minuscule as compared to the arc, convergence between that shield and our wormhole hole would still cause a tremendous backwash of energy. So with the wormhole now shut down, we'd avoided much of the potential danger of the attempt. Yuxa's shell began to decouple itself from the console's cranial attachment. Her part of tonight's operation was over, and I was pleased she was exiting deep immersion to join me in watching from the reel. She opened her eyes and found me. Her smile caused the old familiar warmth I'd always felt from seeing my longtime friend. And, well, that's a relief. Now we just need to be lucky with our aim. Our hopes faded quickly as Omu spoke a moment later. Minervus reports that the Argus Discriminator has completed its initial scan of the sensor imagery and has located the enemy arc, the android reported. Wormhole formation occurred approximately 12 kilometers outside the predicted convergence point of the current vector of the arc. That's 8 kilometers outside the minimum margin of error to expect a successful convergence, Oaks added with a frown. Shit, I exclaimed. We missed. Our pungies had been sewn too far off course from the oncoming arc. It was expected, Ux said softly. This first attempt was for data gathering with minimal risk. A new window appeared on the main screen. I recognized the familiar shape of the smaller Sarissa wormhole mechanism. 
18 seconds until arc convergence, Omu reported. Sarissa is now opening its observational wormhole. How far from the arc in the impactors will the Sarissa wormhole be located? I asked. 20,000 kilometers, Ux answered, preempting Omu. She was rubbing her temples and sounded fatigued. It's on a parallel trajectory to the arc, she added. We watched the countdown fall below 15 seconds. The window relaying the image from the Sarissa wormhole now was showing a distant star field. Its sensor was already deployed and panning around rapidly searching for the arc. The now familiar shape was soon centered in the window. Our viewpoint this time was interesting. Instead of looking at the area behind the arc, we were now slightly ahead and looking at its nose from a shallow angle off to one side. I quickly extracted myself from the gravity cradle and pulled myself over to Uksu. I arrived behind her and locked one leg in the base of her cradle for support. Thus anchored, I gently began massaging her neck and shoulders, hoping to ease her fatigue. She sighed and smiled back at me before relaxing. We both turned back to the window showing the arc to find it growing smaller. The imager was zooming out to increase the coverage area. With four seconds remaining, a quickly moving red-colored zone appeared at the extreme edge of the Sarissa feed. This was the region we'd seeded with the kinetic impactors. I was surprised at how fast the closure rate was between the seeded region and the arc. How far will the Punjis have spread when the arc passes? I asked, still hoping for a miracle. At convergence, they will have spread evenly across an area approximately 2.5 kilometers in diameter. Uck said quietly. I remembered that the front end of the arc was about 1.7 kilometers in diameter. Our deployment had occurred off-center of the arc's course by 12 kilometers, and we had 37 rods spreading over a diameter of 2.5 kilometers. My faint remaining hope faded. The countdown reached zero, and as expected, no explosions blossomed on the bow of the arc. The countdown began counting up as the red zone representing our minefield disappeared out of view behind the arc. The attack was officially over. Our impactor rods lost forever to the void. I felt Ux's shell slump in my arms as my ex-wife fled back into virtual to parse the incoming data. Oh well, at least she joined me for the important moment. The sudden emotional surge I felt surprised me. The recent events were beginning to affect me. I frowned as there was still so much to do. Ongmu began speaking, and it took me a moment to focus on the android's words. Sensors from Sarissa detected high-energy emissions during the final seconds before the arc passed the impactor field. This confirms that the enemy does have an active detection network for oncoming objects that may have bypassed any debris shield. How soon can we try another kinetic attack, I asked, ignoring the android's message. At least 40 hours, I could course, Ux replied, surprising me. She'd not gone fully into virtual after all. Double that if we want to send the upgraded impactor package. The guided option? I asked. Yes, the upgraded impactor bundle with terminal maneuvering capability, she replied. Of course, there will be a much greater risk if we attempt that option as the impactor bundle would need to be deployed much further from the arc. I recalled the parameters for deploying the enhanced impactors. The guidance package needed time to maneuver the four-ton bundle from wherever the wormhole dropped it back into the path of the enemy. We'd estimated that this would take roughly two minutes, and this meant that instead of deploying at two light seconds separation, we'd need eight to ten light seconds of separation. In terms of physical distance, the additional six to eight light seconds meant that the deployment would occur 2.4 million kilometers in front of the arc instead of 600,000 kilometers. This increased the danger in two main ways. First, it gave the enemy five times longer to spot the bundle in its path. Worse, detection would be much easier because the bundle would be using powerful thrusters to rapidly shift the bundle onto an interception trajectory. Worse, the actively maneuvering objects in front of the arc would scream to our enemy that they were under active, intelligent attack instead of just dealing with abnormally dense space junk. While our days of enjoying such anonymity were rapidly dwindling, once that point was passed, it was passed for good. The second major danger of deploying the impactors five times further away was that we ran the risk of colliding with the ARCS's aforementioned leading interstellar debris shield. We had still not yet spotted this protection, but it was likely that the more distant deployment would rectify that. 
The AIs reasoned that the Ark utilized a type of Whipple shield similar to that which our own interstellar colonizer vessels employed. We had not yet spotted the enemies, mainly because we were not sure how far in front of the Ark its shield or shields were deployed. Hopefully, we could deploy rapidly enough to again fall in the gap, far enough ahead or even behind. Of course, our theories about the shield could be completely wrong. Maybe the Ark used some other method? Maybe an active protection mechanism, like a big laser or even a magnetic deflector. We knew that they communicated across interstellar distances by laser. Maybe it was dual function? One of the topics scheduled for discussion in the upcoming briefing was whether to continue with our attacks or to pause our offensive and instead perform more scouting and reconnaissance. I still wanted to keep attacking, but I was torn. The risks to the big Phobos wormhole mechanism were very real. As I was saying, Omu said, after pausing to make sure she had our attention, Sarissa's reconnaissance, in addition to confirming active scanning for nearby incoming debris, detected physical activity on the nose of the Ark itself. What activity? I asked, while feeling Ux relax again a second time in my arms. I tilted her head back and verified from her slack expression that she had gone fully into virtual this time. Please direct your attention to the main display. Omu instructed. I did and saw that the live Sarissa telescope view had now zoomed in tight on the bulbous nose of the alien arc. I could see a blip of motion. A few pixels of artificial construction were shifting amidst the chaos of craters, scars, and rents, which pockmarked the nickel iron bow of the enemy vessel. What is that? I asked. The AI Advisory Council estimates that what you are seeing is an active interstellar debris defense in the process of standing down, Omu said. A second window appeared next to the first and displayed an enhanced view. I could now see that the object was hexagonal in shape. The motion resembled a six-sided flower closing in on itself. Are those petals doors of some kind? I asked. More correctly, the objects in motion are overlapping hatch covers. Ux answered, instead of Omu. She had spoken with her normal voice, which indicated that she was not too deeply interfaced. As I was holding her neck with its unconnected cranial shunt, I should have realized that she was just skimming the virtual data feeds. I am attempting to quickly augment the Sarissa deployed sensor with a spectral laser scanner before the hatch cover fully closes, she stated. It took me a moment to parse her statement. I recalled when we had earlier scanned the arc with such a laser to determine the materials of its construction. If we could scan the inside of the closing orifice, maybe we could deduce the mechanism's function from the materials it was constructed of. The small window that showed our side of the Sarissa facility was busy with activity as mobile units rushed around, trying to maneuver a bulky object into position near the stalk, penetrating the small active wormhole. I tried to follow both windows, comparing the closing hatch to the activity to install the additional scanner. Suddenly, the frantic work on Vesta stopped. I looked back to the two windows displaying the nose of the arc and watched the hatch complete its closure, sealing the interior of the hexagonal shaft off from view. We were too late. Moments later, the windows went dark as the sensor was retracted, the Sarissa wormhole terminating immediately after. Ux sat up partially. Fuck, not enough time to deploy the laser, and Sarissa ran too low on energy. Ook's swearing was a rarity. What were you hoping to find? I asked soothingly. I was hoping to scan the interior of the shaft way under that heavy cover. Depending on the spectral backscatter, we'd have a better idea if the mechanism inside was an energy beam weapon or a linear accelerator. Now we will have to wait for it to be deployed again. I was still confused about what had happened after our failed attack. Help me understand, Ooks. I get that our impactors were deployed too far off course, but what do you think was happening on the bow of the Ark? What likely happened, John, and remember this is just a guess, is that the enemy's forward-looking scanners detected the impactors right after they were deployed. Before it could verify that the rods did not pose a threat, it began activating some form of close-in debris protection system. The orifice that was exposed was probably the firing port for that device, Ux explained. The Sarissa sensors also detected the signatures of discrete focused energy emissions reflecting off many of the closer impactor rods, Omu added. 
This indicates the enemy arc employs a scanning method capable of independently tracking multiple incoming objects at once. There was a moment of silence with Ux and me deep in thought. I yawned, which spread to Uxes. My implant's chronometer indicated that it was just before midnight, and I had had a long day. I was not sure where Uxa was on her personal circadian rhythm, but as she was also clearly tired, it must have been close to mine. So, what does all this mean? I asked tiredly. It means, Ux said, opening her eyes and looking at me gravely, that our next attack will, despite being risky as hell, also answer many questions as to how the Ark defends itself. Coprates Chasma, Vales Marineris, Mars. Monday, December 11th, 3116, two days later. Dawn was nearing. For the past few hours after concluding the virtual briefing, I tried to settle my mind by painting. I remained frustrated, though, as I struggled with my fine brushwork in the light Martian gravity. My pride kept me from utilizing Naomi via my implant to forcefully attune my muscles and nervous systems to the surface conditions, and thus my work had suffered. I'd finally given up on the whole effort 20 minutes ago, feeding the half-completed canvas into the reducer along with my consumables. Possibly I'd try again in the future, after I'd become better adjusted. Now I was meditating, sitting in a padded alcove next to the habitat's single large exterior viewport and watching the Stark Valley emerge in the increasing light. There was music in the background, as Ambassador Riho was awake as well, engrossed in her tenorune. The alien-sounding melody she was playing was the perfect backdrop to the slowly unveiling vista I was observing out the viewport. Despite the early local hour, neither of us was tired. Our circadian rhythms were still firmly attuned to elsewhere, at least half a day out of sync with this location on Mars. And with constant travel remaining on our vagabond itinerary, neither of us had bothered to use our implants to forcibly alter our day and night cycles to this current respite. Riho's strange music droned on, and I remembered enough to know that she was nearing the end of her current composition. She might finish in time to observe the sunrise along with me. We were staying in the main guest habitat complex in Seaside, the largest human settlement on the floor of Valles Marineris. Specifically, we were near the central region of the solar system's grandest canyon, deep in a prominent feature named Coprates Chasma. If someone had sought out the bottommost point of the vast canyon system, Coprates Chasma would be where one would look. In ancient Martian times, there had been a vast, one-kilometer-deep lake in this location. Today there were new man-made lakes, although they, they were tiny in comparison to the Caspian Sea-sized natural body of water from Mars's long-ago history. The settlement had been so named because of the new lakes. The large open water impoundments were a result of a nearby subsurface ice mining and processing. Although the lakes were constantly boiling away due to the low Martian surface pressure, one of the smaller and less briny ponds was protected under a pressure curtain. We were scheduled to meet Ben and Deja on the beach there later this morning. Our habitat was located on the northern fringe of Seaside. This meant that the thick rising mist from the open bodies of water were barely visible off to the extreme right of the current field of view, visible out of the eastern-facing viewport. This was a benefit to my current sightseeing, as the constant southerly winds coming from the plateaus to the north blew the heavy vapor trails away and deeper into the canyon system. Otherwise, all I would be witnessing would be a heavy fog illuminated by a faint dawn glow. As it was, I was able to see the reddish Martian canyon bottom gradually rising to the more abrupt cliffs at the edge of the surface plateau, 30 kilometers to the east. The top of that ridge was now sparkling by diffracted light from the sun about to crest. The higher canyon peaks further to the north already brightly lit from exposure to the sun's rays. Riho's music came to a close and shortly after, I felt her presence beside me. I glanced at her and returned her smile. As always, after playing her tenor rune, she looked serene. I took her hand and returned to watching the building. Natural beauty. Another morning greets us, Ziatile, I said softly, as the new sun emerged, bathing us in its yellow light. She did not reply, so I spared a glance. Her eyes were shining, and she'd stiffened slightly. Finally, she spoke softly. The view from this place is so very much like views from my homeworld, John. I apologize. 
My emotions overwhelm me. That's perfectly fine, I offered, squeezing her hand slightly. Do you miss it? Yes, I do. But I am also happy to be here and in service to you, she replied. I'm thankful for both. We continued to watch the evolving morning, with the sun now high enough to illuminate the canyon floor most of the way to the rim, the residents of Seaside, who were active topside, were now visible going about their business. All wore light pressure garments against the low pressure and face masks due to the high CO2 atmosphere. The temperatures here on the valley floor and near the industrial operations were high enough that only a light insulative covering was needed. Some of the residents were distinguishable as Martian-born. With their increased lung capacity, the smaller air packs they wore set them apart from the migrants. A sizable number of androids and mobile units were moving about as well. Some of these were being teleoperated by humans elsewhere in the habitat, or even far from Mars with the low-latency micro-hole comm network now active. Do you remain dissatisfied with the outcome of the virtual briefing, John? Riho asked carefully. Yes, I replied, sighing, although I still can't quite explain why. The briefing had ended without the revelation of any new tactic or method which would compensate for the lack of success of our first two attack attempts. Further analysis of the data we'd obtained during both attacks, including the later data dump from the microprobes, was presented. The main gist of the briefing was to confirm what we'd already suspected, that the enemy arc possessed a robust defensive capability against both trailing pursuers and incoming threats. The briefing started by exploring how our antimatter missiles had been intercepted, about how the ARC had detected our incoming warheads, and how they had been neutralized using mine-based standoff weaponry. The closer sensor data from the microprobes revealed that the enemy maintained overlapping waves of deployed mines. The probes also confirmed that the assemblage had a fast-acting replacement ability to fill in any gaps in their coverage when one of the defending mines was utilized. We could only speculate on the number of replacement mines available. Those true numbers would be known only by continuing to send pursuer warheads. Though it was likely we would prevail in such a war of attrition, simply by our possession of an entire solar system of resources, it could still end up being a long-lasting effort, a true long, stern chase. Our analysis led to speculation that the stout stern defenses possessed by the Ark had come about recently. It was unlikely they had needed such a defense at the time of their departure, although there was a slim chance that they possessed it from the beginning, possibly fleeing some sort of civil war. The more likely reason for the defenses was because of the Hemru. It was likely that the Hemru had launched more than the one long-range attack we detected. The basis for this reasoning was the lack of fresh impact data on the rear of the Ark. From this, we concluded that the Hemru attack from 16 years ago had been repulsed just like our more recent one had. The briefing then focused on ways to counter the minefield defense. Two promising modifications to our attack methods emerged. The first was to continue researching efforts to improve our warheads enough so that they could withstand more extreme maneuvering and hopefully evade the standoff mines. The second recommendation was to attempt antimatter attacks aimed at the sides of the arc instead of its stern. The latter option presented new unknowns. We were not sure to what extent the enemy mines provided coverage to attacks from the side. This was simply because the mines had to remain in the protected zone behind the arc and its shields or risk being damaged by interstellar debris. We were also unsure as to the function of the arc's central rotating bands, which had been observed early on. Were these mounts for defensive weaponry? Maybe a third defensive mechanism? To verify both, it was decided that another attack using our less capable existing warheads would be attempted. This time, the attacking missiles would be delivered from well-off axis to the vector of the arc. The missiles would use their limited maneuvering energy to curve in towards the arc as they approached, aiming for the hopefully less defended central tapering segment. The time frame for this attempt was long as it would require a full fuel load for both the Phobos Dynamo Array and the nearly depleted Sarissa Array. The former would take almost a full month while the fuel shipment currently en route to Vesta had an estimated time of arrival in three weeks. The second topic of discussion covered the kinetic impactor attempt on the bow of the Ark. Due to the low chances of planting a second, similar close proximity deployment with enough accuracy to score a hit, it was decided to attempt the riskier, 
longer range method using the guided bundle. A guidance stage would be attached to the bundle to push it from wherever it arrived into a collision course with the enemy. Once it had been guided into the correct place, the bundle would separate, spreading out so as to maximize potential objects to be intercepted. It was likely that the ARC's forward-looking weapon would deal with some of our impactors, but hopefully not all. As with the first stern attack, we would be deploying micro-probe scouts to monitor what happened. Regarding the forward-facing weapon, the AI's conclusion was that the ARC possessed a big high-energy laser rather than a mass driver. The reasoning was that, as the assemblage already needed a big forward-facing laser to send messages to its future colony worlds, efficiency demanded that such a resource serve multiple functions. Having a calm laser that could also destroy oncoming debris simply made too much sense. We still needed confirmation, of course. The frontal attack could happen much sooner, as it would require far less energy than the stern attack option. A consensus was reached to try the riskier frontal attack next. This would happen as soon as Phobos and Vesta had sufficient fuel, and because this option required less fissionable, we were going to bypass the inflexible shipping schedule to Vesta by transferring fuel directly from the Phobos orbital refinery to the asteroid via wormhole. Currently, the only facility with both the range and available energy reserves was the Lunar Interplanetary Transport Facility. Using this facility for fuel delivery was unprecedented as it would disrupt the long queue of human transport. Many of the other members of the briefing had voted against this action, so I'd used my authority to push it through. I was sure that once the details of my dictatorial action leaked, I would likely again be vilified by the masses. Here's hoping for at least some success from the pending attack to salve the system-wide butthurt. Are you having second thoughts about forcing the timeline of the third attempt against the majority will of the briefing? Riho asked, guessing exactly what I'd just been mulling over. Well, it's not the first time I've done that. Riho was tactful enough not to probe my non-answer. The truth was, I did feel uneasy about what I'd just done, and it was too late to back off on the plan as the wormhole fuel transfers using the lunar facility had already commenced. Omu had reported that complaint threads were going viral on the larger Conscientia travel forums, not only from the obvious travel disruptions, but also because of the heightened danger from transshipping the highly radioactive fuel. The bright flare of an orbital taking off from Seaside's spaceport brought me out of my pit of self-doubt. I used my smart irises to zoom in on the distant event, which looked to be a cargo and water tanker. I checked the local launch schedule and found that the launcher's destination was the Elon 2 space station. More water, oxygen, and reboost hydrogen consumables to replenish the station's reserves. I also noted a large quantity of biomass consisting mostly of locally farmed brine shrimp on the manifest. Omu and I would be riding a similar but passenger-rated launch vehicle from the same spaceport tomorrow for a quick tour of Alec and Hannah's project. A month ago, space dock capacity had become available for their construction project in one of the orbital fabrication shipyards, which shared the orbit with the main habitat. Riho was staying behind as she'd scheduled a long session with her virtual doppelganger, stuck back in the SRP on Earth. It had been many months since she had last melded with her hemrushell twin, and the lack of convergence had been weighing on her. As before, I was anxious about their convergence, as the previous time, she'd returned acting oddly. The launcher was now gone from our view, having passed beyond the eastern lip of the canyon. I sighed and turned to Riho. Come, Mavers has recommended a local cafe that serves a highly rated breakfast. While I normally doubted culinary advice from an AI, even the local expert, they also have a bakery. It's hard to mess up a donut. I would have to remember to order a dozen to go for our later meeting with Ben and Her Highness. Mars Orbital Fabrication Shipyard 2, located 20 kilometers ahead of the Elon 2 space station. Tuesday, December 12th, 3116. What are you going to name it? I asked Hana. Alec wanted to name it the Oizaki, but I insisted on Higgins, she replied. Her voice sounded a bit too loud over the suit to suit tight net comm system. I sub vocalized the command to reduce the volume. Whoever had used my suit before had obviously been working with noisy handheld equipment. Higgins, I thought. Why was that name familiar to me? I tried to think back to any small warships or spacecraft that had been called that, but came up short. 
I can't remember why, but that name sounds familiar to me, I finally admitted. Well, I was never a fan of history when I was young, but since warfare is new to our reborn civilization, Alec and I have been studying notable past military assaults in the data archives. That jogged my memory. You named it after the Higgins boats of the Second World War? When you think about it, this vessel has a very similar purpose to those old landing craft. Space worthiness aside, they both have a very short range and are good for only one thing, delivering troops into the breach of the enemy. I nodded as I thought about it. Yes, the vessel I was looking at definitely looked to be designed for one task, safely landing its occupants onto the enemy's territory. And like the landing craft of W-2, this boat was similarly utilitarian in a brute force way. First, it was long and narrow. It had to be to fit through a Phobos wormhole. The center portion was obviously the habitation module, as it was a solid-looking cylinder with rounded ends and clearly designed to hold pressure. On each end of the central structure were long, boxy structures festooned with fuel tanks, engine thruster snouts, and a maze of plumbing and control conduits. The thrusters pointed in all directions and would grant the craft quick maneuverability. There were additional thrusters pointing downward to what was clearly the bottom of the long landing boat. I could imagine the fast deceleration they would provide as the boat neared the hull of the enemy arc. I pulled myself down handhold by handhold so I could view the underside of the craft. Hannah followed me, staying within range of the suit's open broadcast tight net link. I'm impressed that you and Alec have been doing historical research. Do you think any of it will apply to storming an alien spaceship? I asked. Not a lot of the naval stuff. Well, except maybe the ship boarding techniques. I think we're getting the most value from studying police and military infiltration tactics, Hannah replied. Higgins's underside came into view, and I could tell from the cross-bracing bands that this face had additional armor fitted. At each end was a pair of rugged-looking landing legs. Each had wide foot pads ringed with three retracted penetrator claws. I'd remembered seeing similar grippers a long time ago and struggled to recall where. Had Jonathan's interceptor ship used such grippers? Three hatches were also visible on the underside of the habitat module. Two smaller, personal-sized airlock portals near the ends and a large, square hatch near the center. The central hatch was ringed by a deployable breaching tunnel which had magnetic seals. One of the small hatches opened and disgorged a space-suited human. I recognized the suit's wild color pattern about the same moment I heard my son's voice over the tight net. Hi, Dad. Welcome to Higgins, or better known as Oizuki, Alex said, glancing at Hannah with a smug look. Just Higgins, Hannah replied firmly. Looks impressive so far, son, I replied, ignoring the naming controversy issue completely. He jumped easily and accurately across to the handhold next to us. I was impressed at how easily he handled himself in the weightlessness of the construction yard. As you can see, the bulk of the ship is complete. We just have to fit out a few sensor clusters and add the ablative coating, Alex said, gesturing to various points on the bottom of the vessel as he did. I take it it lands bottom side first and then uses the grapples on the landing legs to hang on, I asked. Correct. The legs are oversized and can absorb an impact of almost 30 kilometers per hour although I would not want to try it without being strapped into the impact chairs. How big is it? I asked, trying to estimate the ship's length. Forty meters in length and five meters in diameter. We're still thinking of last-minute equipment to add, so I can't give you the final mass yet. But I can predict that it will be right up near the limit of what Phobos can currently send to the Ark at a matching velocity, Alec replied. I noticed that he looked perturbed as he finished answering. I glanced at Hannah. He's just upset that because of the enormous energy cost, it will be a one-way trip for Higgins, she explained. Success or fail, once we send her, she will not be coming back. I hope that does not include the passengers, I asked. No, when it's time to return, or if Higgins is disabled, each impact chair enclosure will be jettisoned through topside ejection ports. The enclosures are like tiny little spaceships all on their own, and we will use those to return through the wormhole, Alec explained. Let's go check them out. His pride and excitement made me smile as I let him pull me to the open hatch. The inner airlock hatch was also open, so Higgins was unpressurized. Alec entered first and then helped me through the narrow lock. 
The interior of Higgins took me right back to the time I'd spent living inside Nautilus. It was a maze. Jumbled piping, equipment, and ESU energy units fitted everywhere, with just the narrowest of passages remaining for us to squeeze through. Everything was painted a matte white and lit by many small glow strips. Each lighting strip had a matching red band to allow the ship to be rigged for red, making for a definite military feel. Hannah joined us inside, forcing us to move away from the hatch. Omu, not wanting to add to the crowding, simply stuck her head inside the inner hatch while keeping her body in the lock itself. Alec began pointing out equipment and functions. The most notable objects were the four impact chair enclosures. The spherical housings were aligned down the long axis of the cylindrical crew compartment and were grouped in pairs with two fore and aft of the main central breaching hatch. Alec led me to the nearest and cycled open its sliding curved hatch. Inside the 250-centimeter diameter pod was a well-padded seat. For some reason, I was reminded of the ball turret of an old bomber, but these being much larger and less cramped. I saw no controls or displays except for two side-mounted handheld joysticks. Alec explained that while the impact chairs were designed to be used while the occupant was in virtual, they could also be used in manual if needed, and in which case, the interior of the shell became a full wraparound view screen. I was helped into the seat and felt it mold itself to my suit. Smart hosing snaked out automatically from under the seat and connected to the various gas and data ports on my chest. When Alex slid the hatch closed, the interior of the shell came alive, becoming an unbroken display. Two small windows were showing Alec and Hannah floating just outside the sphere. The remaining surface displayed the exterior view outside Higgins, which was currently the pressurized construction bay workspace we just left. I craned my neck around and saw that the display coverage was complete. I could even make out Omu's lower torso in the camera's field of view. I'd experienced such technology before in my old aircraft, Habu. I felt the seat inflating around me, restricting my movement. I'm going to run the seat's test cycle, Dad. Brace yourself. Alec's voice sounded deeper than it had before as, with a spherical enclosure blocking the suit-to-suit tightnet link, communications were now being routed through Higgins's onboard communication system. The test cycle began, and I felt shoved around as the spherical housing rotated and tumbled quickly. In actual use, the rapid movements were an attempt to keep the human occupants conscious, or failing that, alive. With its massive thrusters, the landing craft could dodge and rotate so rapidly as to cause any human to black out. Thus, the seat enclosures were always trying to keep us on our backs. The jolts were harsh enough that my head was bouncing around the inside of my suited helmet, and I was very glad when the demonstration came to an end. What do you think? Hannah asked as she helped me out of the compact enclosure. I kept from voicing my initial impression that the seats should be renamed Torture Balls and simply nodded. Looks like they will do their job well. Alec then explained that after the mission, or in case of an emergency, when the seats were ejected from Higgins, they had a four-hour life support capacity for an awake occupant. They also had a crude biosuspension function that would sustain a human for up to three months. I noted the number of impact chair enclosures. Why four? I asked. It had been planned that Omu would be joining us, but the android would certainly not need the chairs to survive the ship's aggressive maneuvers. Had they decided to take another human? My first thought was that Adele had finagled herself along for the ride. But if so, how had she learned of our closely held plan? We wanted a backup in case any of the other three enclosures were damaged. Omu can ride the chair in the meantime, and we'll use it when we make our return. If you, Hannah, or I need the spare, Omu can simply ride along by hanging on to the outside of any of them, Alec explained. Ah, that made sense. They next demonstrated the personal arms lockers and augmented mobility suit stations. The mobility suits were pretty neat, much more advanced than the suits I'd used back when Omu and I had stormed Baltra Island. If we did manage to incapacitate the enemy arc to such an extent that we were able to use this ship to board, we would do so while wearing a mobility suit augment. The devices would increase our movement speed and carry strength and even allow us a limited flight ability in microgravity environments. The arms in the locker ran the full gamut of possible personal weaponry. Everything from long EMP pikes that could double as pry bars 
to rocket-propelled grenades and electromagnetic disruption guns. It all looks impressive, I said. In some ways, all this is smaller than I'd imagined. Maybe it was that I imagined it would take a brigade of humans in fleets of landing craft to even attempt to storm the enemy ark. We've rethought the scope of the mission over the past year, Hannah said, especially after our scout probes had returned the first images showing how big the damned ark really is. Higgins is now more of a personal VIP scouting ship. Even I now admit that it would be foolish to visit the ark unless the enemy is completely dead. If we manage to pulverize the ark with our wormhole weaponry, this boat will allow us to visit its corpse. I nodded in reply. With her constant nightmares, Hannah would still need to verify that our enemy was truly dead. This vessel might allow her to do just that. But we'd have to defeat the assemblage before we risk sending humans. Besides, Alec added, we might get lucky and blow the ark to atoms and avoid having to use this boat. Imagine if they have a huge reserve of antimatter and we land the right hit and destabilize their containment. He left the rest unsaid. I could easily imagine the enemy vessel disappearing, Death Star style. Here's to that, I replied. Hannah patted Higgins's hull. If we did that, I'd still want to take a ride over and sniff the dust. At least we could set a record for the most distant a human has thus far traveled from Saul. I nodded while thinking of the fledgling warp drive research soon to begin on Pallas. I had enough faith in Ux's brilliance that I suspected Hannah's record would likely be short-lived. 